Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Before we start, I want to give a shout out to my sponsor, VB Health. Visit loadboost.com and use code Holly for 10% off or click the link in the episode description. Okay, so my guest today, we were actually just talking about how I've been trying to get her on the show for a long time. Uh, She was inspired to get into the industry after she watched some lackluster performances and knew she could do better. And she has definitely proved herself right. She's an iconic performer. She's hosted the AVNs. She's an entrepreneur, a business owner, and she is the latest winner of This Is Fire on OFTV. Welcome, Luna Star. Hi, Raleigh. Thank you so much for having me. No, you're welcome. Super Thank exciting. you for coming. I'm so excited to finally have you here. I know. It's been a long time, but today is the day. <laughs> it is today. Yes. Um, yeah, when you mentioned before, when you said, oh, you know, we've we've been talking about this for a while. And I'm like, yes, yes, I remember. We shot a scene for browsers and you wanted the boots. And I was like, you could have the boots if you come on my podcast. <laughs> and that was like three years ago. I know. And I was like, if I see that bitch out in those boots... I haven't worn them, though, by the way, but I still have them. Okay. <laughs> I remember what you say, but I don't have worn them yet. You were like, you know what? These boots are not worth <laughs> are not worth an episode of Holly's no, podcast. No, they were. They were. It was just always like I was. I would say yes, and and the time would come, and I'll get busy, or yeah. I was not in town, but now I'm in town, and then perfect timing, and yeah. Everything no. came out at the right timing. Yeah. No. And thank you. But and thank you so much. And I'm sorry I haven't been here No, before. it's okay. <laughs> and like I said, like I honestly... I respect you guys are so busy and, you know, you like grant me your time and I'm always super grateful for that. And it's a privilege to have you. It's definitely not like... Well, everybody loves you. So I'm pretty sure everybody that comes here is because they really, really like you and they will give you anything you ask. (laughs) I wish that was true. (laughs) It's true. It's true. It's true. So let's start off by talking about OFTV. So for those of you who don't know, it's OnlyFans' actual, like, uh, mainstream, totally safe for work site. And they have a lot of, like, really cool shows. And one of them is called This Is Fire. It's a cooking show. And it um, puts various, like, performers against each other. If you remember, we had Riley Reed on last time. She was the winner of last season's. And this season, it's Luna Star. So tell us a little bit about that show and, like, how you got invited, and a little bit about the process. Well, I was uh, hosting the AVM, and Alex, he came up to me and told me about these shows. Uh, he told me about a different show uh, in the life of uh, mm-hmm. same yeah. same platform. And then he mentioned the cooking show, and I was like, oh, I want to do the cooking show. I know I can cook really good, but uh, I never be in a competition. But I just thought about, like, if I had to do anything, I would prefer to do a cooking show because mm-hmm. I know like I did it for fun. I honestly didn't even know I was going to win money. So I was when I saw when they told me it was going to be a, a this amount of money. I was so happy about it. But I honestly did it just for the fun part. And I was so impressed with myself that I won. And I know I always cook good. I make all my men fall in love through my cooking. Mm-hmm. So that always helps. And but I compete against a lot of girls that in social media, cook all the time. Mm-hmm. So I was definitely very scared. And every single episode, I was impressed and, and surprised that I won. Yeah. So it, it was like one of those things that I never really won anything in my life like that. And it just makes me so happy. I don't know. It was like, even when I won the last episode, I cried a little bit, like genuinely cried because I didn't even believe it. Yeah. It was kind of cool. It was so, super cool. So tell me how the competition works. So the competition is like they have like eight different chefs and they put you one against each other and and it's like a like a football you will you get selected whoever wins go against each other mm-hmm. and it's just a process of a couple of days and do they like tell you what you have to make or they get you like certain ingredients no, like how does that No we don't work? even know who we go against it and we don't know what we cooking and okay. I think that's the most scary thing yeah. that you just show up it's like a fire kitchen or hell's kitchen okay I think it's the same producer that produced that show so it's a very high TV show. It's very, like, when I saw it, the cinematography, the like, you can tell it's incredibly oh, highly Oh, they produced. did so good. They have yeah. such a huge talent behind the cameras, yeah. and the set is amazing. Yeah. And so, yeah, it was it was so impressive. Like, even when I remember my first episode, I was like, I want this kitchen for me. <laughs> it was that good. It yeah. Was, it was an impressive thing, and I was so happy to be a part of it. And, you know. So you get to set and they say, okay, you need to make this. Because I don't honestly watch reality cooking shows and I know they are all a little different 
Like some of them give you certain ingredients and you have to like make something up and other ones give you a main ingredient. So they do like basically it's like a regular TV show. You go get in the, in the seat, you talk about it before and then, then you go to the kitchen and they just give you a basket and it's a surprise. They tell you what the uh, place is supposed to be like, mm-hmm. but you can switch it up mm-hmm. with the main ingredients. But mm-hmm. the winning part is to have every ingredient they give you to be used in the play. Okay. And I think that's why many episodes, like, I couldn't have last. But because I used all the ingredients, I won that one. So if you don't put all the ingredients in, are you automatically disqualified or you did just dock points? No, I just, I kind of dock points. Meaning, okay. like, if it's, like, a tie and you have one extra ingredient that you're supposed to and the other one didn't, mm-hmm. then you win. Gotcha. Okay. Like, for example, when I went against Sherry Devai, like, or plays were both good, but she forgot a cream inside her... Uh, Sharif French got dough. the cream? I know. She that just doesn't put the, sound <laughs> like <Sharif>. her. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just like uh, both of us messed up and we had to do everything for scratch again. Yeah. And the only thing that I know how to make is really good cream. So my cream was delicious. <laughs> and that's what made me want that episode. If not, mm-hmm. it would have been super tight in that one. Because her play was so pretty. What do you think was the best um, dish you made? I think it was the last one, the one that just came out with Riley. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was her Brancino. I think from all my plays, I think that was my... A one. Okay, so so you won um, OFTV, and then you went up against Riley, who was the winner from last year. Yeah, because every year you go against the winner of the other year. Okay. So I went against Riley that she won last year, and I won that one. So you went like $20,000 to win the show, mm-hmm. and you get extra $10,000 if we won the Super Finals. Oh, wow. So that was a little extra. I was like, oh my goodness, what is going on? And I watched every single episode, and uh-huh. I saw Riley cook. And I was scared. I was so scared because she cooks really good. But I brought my flavor in it, so she couldn't beat that. <laughs> I'm sorry, Lily. I love you. <laughs> so a Branzino, that's something that I usually avoid ordering because it's like, it's the whole fish. Yeah. And it's much. generally like, it's a lot of work to well, eat. Well, I never cooked that in my life. Anything okay. that I cook in this show, I never cooked it. Okay. But I'm really good at like inventing. Okay. So I just cooked it like I would cook just a regular fillet. Fish. Mm-hmm. I just put the same ingredients and mm-hmm. it'll make the whole thing. And it looks really nice. How long? When did you start cooking? Like, when did you learn how to cook? I think, like, all my life, like, I'm from Cuba and my family, I never gonna forget this. We used to get a beach house in the summer and then all the family would go and stay for a couple of weeks in the beach. And my parents and my, the older people would get drunk since like mm-hmm. 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so, like, you know, they would cook some of the main steam, like, big pots for everybody, but it got to the point that would tell us, like, if you guys are hungry, you need to figure out how to cook when you're very young. And you're, like, in the kitchen, like, what am I going to do? So, like, kind of you, you you see how they cook, and then you just start cooking yourself because it was, like, they're drunk. Mm-hmm. We want to eat. So, and start cooking. And I think I learned it like that. And my grandma, they all cook so good. So, I think just washing them yeah. and being poor and basically, like, having three ingredients in the fridge and figure out how to make that at dinner. Yeah. And I think that's why I was always been good at it. Not to know the plate. Just figure it out how to make something that is a potato, make that potato taste the best. Mm-hmm. And what do you think is like the one thing that people don't know about cooking? Or like, is there like a secret trick that a lot of people I aren't think into? for me, it's like people follow too much recipes. Okay. And we all come from different backgrounds. So we all have different spices that we like. Mm-hmm. I think diversity of spices is what makes a really good cooking. Like, okay. for example, like, I don't know how to mix this spice with this spice. Well, what I do, and I did in this show, you can see it clearly, crazy. I put everything in my mouth because I don't know the name of the spices. So I will cook like a basic thing uh-huh. and then I will get a spoon and I'll try a little spicy and I try and I'm like, mm, this doesn't go well. And then I get another spoon and I put a different spice and I would be adding and adding until I could combine a good flavor. Okay. So that's kind of like the best thing and mostly like the top chef that I ever like on Michelin star. That's what they will do. They just experiment with different flavors. Right, right. So what do you think is like your best dish just overall, like outside of the TV show, just what's well, like the Luna Star specialty? Before all of this, before I was vegan, before I'm not vegan anymore fully, but it was seafood pasta. Okay. Because same thing, I, you know, when you go and get a seafood pasta at any restaurant, they just cook all the seafood together and they throw it in the pasta. Mm-hmm. What I used to do, I was cook every seafood separate mm-hmm. and then I'll cook the pasta and then I bring all those flavors together. So when you eat it, the, the squid doesn't taste the same as the fish or the shrimp. Every oh. single thing in the plate tastes different. So when you just get one bite, you like so many flavors mm-hmm. and your mouth 
I was thinking about about that too in the movie. Oh, like he gets a little piece of cheese in the thing, and like mm, you know, the colors <laughs> comes out. So I'm always being into the flavors and mix it all up together. So that used to be my favorite dish to cook. Yeah, and that's what I make many guys fall in love with me. Mm-hmm. I feel like it's more than just your seafood pasta. <laughs> I know, I know, but it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt, but my mom always told me, if you can make a, uh, a guy loves you cooking, they're probably going to love you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Even if, if you go crazy on them, like, okay, at least she cooks good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got to step my game up. My husband is the cook in the family, not me. So oh, well, that's why you marry him. <laughs> yes, that that among many other reasons. But <laughs> yes, the cooking definitely helps. It helps because you go home sure. and the food is ready over yeah. here. It's amazing. Yeah, no, it's great. I mean, he's making dinner tonight. Like. <laughs> So you obviously, you mentioned your family. Um, So you grew up in Cuba. You moved to Miami when you were 15. What was your upbringing in Havana like? Um, You know, I was always in sport. So I'm very grateful for all the sacrifices my parents did for me to be in a better school. Because if you go to a regular school, it's like, it's not bad because the education is good, but it's very poor. Mm -hmm. So if you want to have a higher education, like a better school, better places, like I leave from my school. You want to be in sports because the government helps a lot. The people are in the sports. So they sacrifice so much for me to be into sport and have the best equipment and stuff. I used to be a professional swimmer. Oh. So I used to live in the school and I have really good upcoming when it comes to educations and like lifestyle. Thanks to that. But I, I always told my mom and I always told everybody I wasn't born to live in Cuba. Because not many people have the possibility to know what is outside Cuba. And yeah. that's why they get so stuck in the country. Yeah. But I always have the vision and I, and my parents and my family always like live outside the Cuba. So I was like, this country is not for me. I mm-hmm. can do so much better than this. Mm-hmm. Like, like there was so much life out there than that little island. Yeah. So I was just, I couldn't wait to get out. Yeah. It was, uh, it was like one of those things that I appreciate. But I don't like it. <laughs> yeah. Do you ever go back? I went back a few times. I went back after the, I won the show. Mm-hmm. I donated a lot of money. I wanted to donate it to the to the people because people are very poor. But Cuba is like you have the government, the people. You don't have a meetup thing. You don't yeah. have a place that you can just go and donate and help people. Yeah. Uh, my family is in the medical, and my uncle would tell me like they would use one pair of gloves for the whole day in the hospital. Wow. Like, there's no like, just change, change, put it up. No, it was yeah. one, rip up. Like, it, so I wanted to help them and I couldn't because there's no one that you can help to. So all you can do is buy stuff and bring them. So what it. I did, I ended up finding um, a small personal companies to help animals. There's not a company. It's like people, they just make their house a center for animals. Yeah. And I just like, Bought a bunch of bags of food. And I still do it, even though I already was the money in it. Mm-hmm. But I help them and bring them cat food, dog food, um, for the baby dogs, stuff like that that they don't have over there. And that's what I did. That's the only reason I went back to Cuba, because I never wanted to go back. And I have my family and stuff. And every time that I go there, I feel so sad and so depressed. Yeah. It's just like, doesn't matter how much money you have, you can never help everybody. Yeah. And it's just, I literally come depressed every time I come from Cuba. I'm sorry. Like I did the family. I helped them as much as I can. And then I went once as a tourist and I loved it in 2019. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, I can come back here without having to feel guilty. You just go to the beaches. Mm-hmm. And then the pandemic hit and that just kill it. Whatever left they have in the country that was beautiful, it was done. So. Oh, really? Now, not even with money, you can enjoy it over there. Yeah. I think so. I think it's still a beautiful country. But for me, it's, it's now. So it's always interesting to talk to somebody who didn't grow up in America. What do you think Americans take for granted as natural born citizens? I think the biggest thing is freedom mm-hmm. and the possibility that you can make anything in this country. I yeah. hate people that are born in this country. One, that they don't have a passport and you're American. Mm-hmm. Come on. Mm-hmm. That gets me so mad because it took me so much effort, money to get my passport. And then the other one is like, you can make anything you want in this life and still be free. You don't have to be a slave of money and work, but you can make up to be happy and get anything you want. Even with you like need the government and that's a different long story. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can still make anything you want. If you work hard, you can make stuff out of it. You can have a better life without being a criminal. Mm-hmm. And in many countries, there were country people are forced to do criminal works just to survive. Yeah. And just having the freedom that you can just be normal and free. Onto your own choices. I think they take that for granted. Yeah. And then one of my biggest things is traveling. Like I told you, not having a passport, not traveling. Oh, that just blew my mind. Like yeah. every time that I, I was like, you were born in this country, you don't have a passport. 
What are you doing? And that's pretty common. It's super common. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm always blown away. Yeah. When I hear that, I was like, is that, I think it's that people don't appreciate the freedom that they have here. And I think they get so stuck in like they get this stuck. and that. And yeah. And I think like traveling is such an important way to educate yourself and expand your mind, you know, like Definitely. people who get really stuck in this one track like way of thinking and way of life. Like when you travel and you see the way other people live and you see different cultures, I, I feel like it's just really helpful for you to like balance for to balance. balance. It Mostly because if you have if you have everything in your life, then you kind of get stuck in that and you think, oh poor me, poor me. And then you realize there's so many people actually in the world like yeah. suffering, being hunger. Yeah. So like once you experience that that I come from that, you appreciate every little thing in life. Like I have no money. I have a lot of money. I have lost all my money. And I never feel what I felt when I was living in Cuba. Mm -hmm. It's always like the willing of I can do again. I mm -hmm. can work harder again. I can create again. It's like the opportunity of always growing is in this country. Unfortunately, this country is not as good as it was before, but it's still you can make anything how you see your mind and it's not complaining. People complain too much in this country. Like they're so vain about complaining about every little thing. And there's so much shit going on in the world that once you experience it, you'll be like, you don't have nothing to complain about. Just yeah. enjoy life. This life is amazing. Just leave it. Do you think that that's like one of your um, strengths is a sense of gratitude? And do you think that's something that a lot of people lack just in general? I think so too. And, you know, like even me, like I work so hard and I done so much for my life. You know, you still got cut off and like, oh, I should, I wish I had more. But then I, I always come back and realize where I come from and what I have accomplished. Mm -hmm. That I don't need more. Do I want more? Yes. But I'm I'm good because I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. One dollar. I appreciate it. Any type of money, dollars. It's appreciation of what you have. Yeah. Like living in a penthouse or living in your car. Yeah. It's appreciating that you still have the freedom to go and get something. Yeah. You know, like in Cuba, it doesn't matter how much money you have, you still want to be stuck in the same place. Yeah. So the appreciation part people don't have in this country a lot. Yeah. I think that that's something that definitely is lacking for a lot of people. And I find when I get myself like in a feeling in a funk or feeling kind of depressed, I have to pull out that gratitude. Right. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'll like write lists. And um, like this morning I woke up and I like laid in bed for five minutes. I'm like, okay, 10 things I'm grateful for. Mm -hmm. And that really kind of helps me set my day up. Cause you're right. Like we do have so much. Yeah. And I mean, we, we, we need to remember like where we came from. Yeah. I think like uh, the core of who we are is what makes us who we're going to become. Like mm -hmm. when people like wish so much, I wish to be this, I wish to be that, I want to be this person. And like the honest truth, you don't know what that person has come from mm -hmm. and what that person is going through. Yeah. So you have to focus on what you have or you have accomplished and what you, what makes you feel happy because money is not just happiness. It's how you feel about it mm -hmm. that makes you happy mm -hmm. or, or content. Happiness, it only lasts a little bit, but just being comfort and then feeling good about yourself. You don't have to be happy all the time. That's, that's an statement. I think that's another trap that we fall into too. And I found myself dealing with the same thing because especially like in America, we sell happiness. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I mean, people want to be happy, right? So like, you'll be happy if you do this. You'll be happy if you look like this. You'll be happy if you eat these things or you take these vitamins or you drink this wine or whatever it is. And I think that I remember, it's so funny, like I honestly, the, having this podcast and sitting down and talking to people like you for like an hour at a time has really enriched my life and taught me so much. And I take away nuggets from everybody that I speak to. And I remember Kissa Sins told me that she embraces the sadness when she gets it. And she goes, I don't mind being sad. When I'm sad, I'll like play sad music. I'll cry. And she's like, and I, I don't mind. I like it. I embrace it because that's part of the journey of life. It's the ups and downs. Mm -hmm. And so I take that sadness and I embrace it. And then, you know, and then I come out of it and I was like, man, it's you know, beautiful. and I think about how like, you know, especially with, you know, my alcoholism that I dealt with for so long, I was always trying to escape sadness. I didn't want to deal with it. So like, let me try this thing and this thing and this thing to get me out of that feeling when like, really? Sometimes you just got to sit in your sad feelings and just process it so I that think you, you can get through it. you have to leave it. You have to leave it to understand it. Yeah. It's like when you're trying to escape it with any sustenance or, or fakeness or activities, it's always going to come back. Mm-hmm. 
And my mom always used to tell me, like, for you to enjoy the light, you have to go through the tunnel tunnel of darkness. Yeah. And it's like Kinsa says, and I think I have this conversation with her too. It's like feeling, feeling what you're feeling is good. Feeling sad, feeling depressed. It's like understanding why this coming from and you can overcome it on just leave it. Mm-hmm. Like, like I said, like you cannot be happy all the time. That's, that's. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, just leave it, leave it good, leave the bad, learn. And I think like as a humans, the best way to like overcome everything is learning. Yeah. We will never stop learning until we die. Yeah. So every day is something new. Like we were talking outside, like mm-hmm. we don't know anything. All we know is how we feel and everything that makes us is experience that we have collected since we were born. Mm-hmm. So once you know that, whenever something happened to you, you can be like, okay, I feel this type of way. Let me change it because I have the power of changing how I feel. Yeah. And you don't necessarily have the power to change the world around you, but you have the power to change your reaction to the world yeah. around you. Someone told me once, if you can change your life by changing the way you think. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. You can be sad, you can be depressed, you can be happy, but you have how you see it. You know, what is your happiness? It can be my sadness. What is my sadness? It can be your happiness, you know? Mm-hmm. So I think it's just like uh, people need to learn how to live and not take everything so personal. And mm-hmm. we all think that everybody else are a reflection of what we're thinking. And people don't think the way that you think about yourself. Mm-hmm. And once you learn that, it's like life, it becomes a veil out of your body that nothing else matters other than you being in your own world living your own things and pushing the love. The more love that you give, the more love you receive. Mm-hmm. And that's about it. Do you think that this type of view has helped you with working in the adult industry and like dealing with, you know, internet trolls or the stigma or do you even really experience any of that? I think like everybody else we do. I don't read my bad comments and nothing affects me because I don't take anything personal. Yeah. I always think like whenever someone says, even when I was younger, even before the industry, people would like come at me and say, something or insulting me I always react to like you have to be hurting so much inside for you to try to hurt me mm-hmm. without you knowing me without knowing my story yeah so I never let it affect me and it, I never had any problems in the industry but I think it's because the way that I see life whenever it comes someone comes to me with a problem or a thing like all I can give you is my best advice or I don't take anything that doesn't make me feel good like I just don't let your problems or your way of seeing me affect me because it's not going to change what I'm going to do. I'm going to still do it. Everything that I've done, I've done it for the right reasons. So there's nothing you can tell me that's going to hurt me. Mm-hmm. Even doing the industry, people at the beginning say so many things about me, but I was so conscious of what I did this, this for that it never affected me. No once. Like everybody came at me and say, oh, this crazy thing. They came after my parents. They say all oh, these things to my parents. And I remember my mom telling me, you're a good daughter. Everything that you have done is to help us. You have never changed. You've always been so grateful. And like, even since my first check, I helped my parents because I know everything that they did for me. And this is a stigma that they want you to do this and that to be a better person. But I know that what I did is because it was going to make me better mm-hmm. economically and physically and like emotionally because it makes me free than be stuck in a nine to five when I was really suffering. Yeah. You know, and then like my mom told me, it's like, I have a friends that the kids are lawyers and doctors. They don't talk to the parents. They don't take care of the parents. Yeah. They probably make more money than me and they don't have the parents. Mm-hmm. And whatever money I ever have, if I'm good, I want my parents to be good. So that makes you like, I have a reason why I did this. So there's nothing you can tell me that's going to hurt me because yeah. I didn't do it for bad reason. You know, when you do something for a bad reason and someone comes at you, it hurts more because you'll be like, oh, I'm doing something bad. Yeah. But when you're done, nothing affects you. Yeah. It's just like, it's just takes my veil out and like, People insult me and I just laugh because I was like, you don't know me. Yeah. People think that they know you because of videos that you do. And I'm like, that. I'm not even a quarter of what you see on the internet. But that's part of life. That's part of being entertainment, that be Josh. But when you take it, it's when it affects your career. So I don't think it would never affect me because I only take the possibilities, the good things that they say, and then the bad ones, I just leave it there. Yeah. They get blown by the time. Nobody cares. People that say <laughs> stuff about me later on, they will be like, oh, you remember me? I used to know you. I'm like, don't you were talking shit about me before? <laughs> now you're going to be my friend. So, but I don't take it personal. Don't yeah. Know. You you got your own problems. and The way people treat you is always a projection of themselves and what they're going much. through. It's, it l- almost not ever has anything to do with you. No. Yeah. Like if you do something bad, of course, you're not creating yeah. reactions, but then it goes back again. Like if you put bad stuff out there, bad stuff are going to happen to you. Mm-hmm. If you do good stuff and good intention, nothing will happen to you. So you believe in the law of attraction? 
Law of attraction, like, people call it karma. And, but I, in general, it's like, if you're walking to a good path, good stuff is gonna happen. As soon as you turn to the wrong path, bad stuff gonna happen to you. That's mm-hmm. what you have to see. Like, if you go to the ghetto, shit gonna happen. Yeah. If you go to the nice city, nice thing is gonna happen. So you have to see the way, that way. The, try to always do good and good stuff is gonna happen to you. Yeah. So I'm assuming that you're still close with your family. I'm super close with all of them. And they accept what you do for a living. They love, but my, like when I say they love it, it's not a stigma of the adult part. Mm-hmm. They just love the what I have come, mm-hmm. what I have done with it. Mm-hmm. And they see me that I'm happy. They see that I help everybody. They see that, you know, they see that I feel better. And then I think they love that. My mom and everything is like, oh, this is my daughter. Even my dad, when I go out with him, he was like, yeah, that's my daughter. Like very proud of it. Because it, it becomes me a very secure person that I can like outcome anything just know the word stigma of me being an adult actress. That's not all I am. Mm-hmm. Everything that I did through that is to become better. I have my business, do all of this stuff that I do. So yeah, they're very proud and they love it. And they all, now because I'm a little famous, they're like, oh, my dad is famous. And I'm, like, I'm not that famous. <laughs> so they kind of like living through me, the life yeah. that they never had. So I, I, I like that too. Yeah, I love that. Mm-hmm. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break and then we're going to come. I swear we're going to talk about porn. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I talk too much about life. <laughs> no, I love it. And actually, this is why I wanted to start this podcast, because having these conversations is is they're just wonderful conversations and people, you know, probably didn't expect you to be as deep as you are. And now they know. <laughs> See, isn't that great? It happens. All right, guys, stick around. We'll be right back. Hey guys, let's talk about stepping up your game in the bedroom. Whether you're looking to impress your partner or just feel more confident, Load Boost by VB Health is here to help. This powerful supplement is designed to improve the quality, size, and even the taste of your load. That's right, Load Boost isn't just about quantity, it's about making every moment count. You know who swears by it? My friends, adult film actors. They rely on Load Boost to deliver on screen, and now you can bring that same level of performance to the bedroom. But it's not just for the pros. VB Health has happy customers across all 50 states and in over 45 countries, and they're loving the results. VB Health takes your safety seriously, too. All of their supplements are made in CGMP certified manufacturing facilities, ensuring the highest levels of purity and safety. So you can trust that what you're putting in your body is top quality. Ready to take your performance to the next level? Try Load Boost and see what everyone is talking about. Visit loadboost.com and use code HOLLY for 10% off or click the link in the episode's description. All right, everybody, we are back. So we talked a little bit about your upbringing in, in Cuba and then you moved to Miami. So how did you actually get into the adult industry in the first place? I'm going to tell the story short. I was just, I had three jobs. I was working a lot. I was going to school for business administration financials. And basically what I learned, because it took me a long time because of my English, all I really learned in school, it was like, you just need money to make money. (laughs) (laughs) And I remember I needed $500 to pay my rent. And I was walking into my apartment. I heard two girls talking about it. They were looking for extra. And what it cost my attention was that they were paying $500 if you show your tits. I was already a first pretty, and I just did my tits. So I was like, in Miami Beach, we can show my tits for free. (laughs) And I was like, wait, what? And I went, it was for a company in Miami. They do like all these parties, it seems. So you have the talent and then you have all these extras. Mm -hmm. And I'm always being really into the camera. I love production and all of that stuff. So I was like so blown away. How big is this? This is not like the videos that you see online. This is a lot going on. Mm -hmm. So while everybody's partying and drinking and all of that stuff, not drinking, drinking water. They're doing all of this stuff. Uh I'm sitting next to the talent and I'm listening to conversation of like about the lifestyle, how much money they're getting, about sugar daddies, and mm-hmm. they buy me this, they buy me that. And I'm like, wait, what? And the video starts, and I remember being behind the camera guy, and it was a threesome. It was Jake Mack and two other girls. Mm-hmm. And it was the most horrible threesome I've ever seen in my life. And I never done porn before, but it was like, I, I can just tell that it was bad. Yeah, And I remember going to the camera and I was like, what is this guy doing? This is horrible. Like, who's watched this? And the guy comes to me and like, oh, you think you can do better? And I'm like, I'm just trying to compare myself to them. But like as an entertainment, yes, I can definitely do better than just laying down on the couch. Mm-hmm. And he just told me, go here, go there. And, um, and that's it. The rest is history. And even my first video, it was a foursome. I know you had it in the thing. Mm-hmm. It was, I did know about it, of course, you know it, but it was like me and the other girl and me and the guy, and then we just get together. 
And as soon as we start, and I'm doing the VJ, I remember the camera guy stops and look at me and, and told me, are you sure you never done this? Because <laughs> I already knew how to open up. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know why. It, it was always... You're just a natural. It was a natural. And yeah. I was like, well, I, I, I sucked it before, but I've never done it in camera. But even the girl that I was with, she had done it for many years. And he was just like, you can compare that the talent is different. Mm -hmm. And because I know she was doing it for the money, even though I was doing it for the money, I also genuinely liked it. I mm -hmm. love being from the camera. I love like bubbly things, yeah. bring all the stuff. So yeah, after that, I was just, I was always good at it. I don't know. So when you finished that video, how did you feel? Did you think like, okay, this is what I was meant to do? Or were you still unsure? Oh, no. I, I, even before we started, I already knew I liked it. I was just like, even to this day, like I don't really need to be with a company. Mm -hmm. uh, I love being in production. I mm -hmm. love with brassers to show out the set, to get your makeup done, mm -hmm. to treat you like a star, yeah. whatever you need. All, all the process that it takes to do a video, I love that. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I always knew, like, I used to joke about it. I was like, I meant to do porn. Like, I was good at it. And like I told you before, I never did it for the fame or, or to be out there in the world. Like, oh, my God, I'm a porn star. No, I just generally do that work. Mm -hmm. It's good money. And then with that money, I do all the stuff. But I generally still like doing porn. And I probably will still do porn for a long time. Yeah. Honestly, like, until they'll call me, I'll probably 60 year old, like, and, and I will probably still do it. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God. It's just the whole process of the... The recording of a video, I liked it. Yeah. And one day I want to be behind the camera too, but I still would like to be in front of the camera too. Yeah. Well, I always feel that if you can spend time in front of the camera, that just makes you like a better director or producer because understanding what it's like to be talent, I think is sometimes like one of the key elements that's missing from a lot of directors. It's true. And because um, it's important to, I never really got it. And though I've never like performed in porn. I hosted a TV show for a uh, Playboy TV. Um, and that experience was like really eye-opening because I had never spent so much time in front of the camera and like hosted a show. And just like the emotional energy that you have to bring to set every day, doesn't matter how you feel, what's going on in your life. Like if your dog died the day before, if your boyfriend just broke up with you, whatever it is, like you got to show up to set and like you have to like Bring it up. Bring it on. And that's fucking hard. It is hard. Like, it is really difficult. I had no idea because, you know, working behind the scenes, I can show up to set and be in a shitty mood and it doesn't matter because mm -hmm. nobody sees me. I can just be like grumpy behind my camera and be like, action. <laughs> yeah, <whatever. laughs> you know, but like if you're on camera, like you have to transform and become someone different. And that is like a Jedi mind trick that's really difficult. It is difficult. And, and I think that's what it becomes a lot of talent that you can tell. Like uh, there's some people that bring bring the problems at work and it, it notice in the camera mm -hmm. and some people like you say you just turn it off like I always thought like I become lunar star when I'm mm -hmm. shooting like I have many problems before my set and it takes a lot to go to set like prepare people just say like oh I'm gonna show up and do anal no it's a preparation that you take a day or two days before mentally physically it doesn't matter what you go out like I can be sad crying as soon as you say action I will turn up on the person that I'm supposed to be for the movie for the video and then that hour, whatever time that we record, I'm a different person. And it, it feels so uplifting because even if you're going through something and you do such a good job performing as the person that you're supposed to, they the expected you and you do a good job, it kind of like brings you a little bit. Mm -hmm. That you're like, my problems is so minimal that there's so much going, so much going on. So many people depend on you, me, my family and the production company. Like if you have sad and you cancel the work, a lot of people don't work. Mm -hmm. So you have to like think about it, the bigger picture. And then it's just like, even in my worst day, you would never see it in the camera. Mm -hmm. Like you just like, I just say, you just shut it down and just do what you have to do. And kind of like helps a little bit. It's like a psychology. That yeah. You're like, you can do better. You know, you, you can fake it so good yeah. that you believe it yeah. that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny because you mentioned, you know, you can't just show up to set and do anal. But actually, you did have to do that for me once. Remember <laughs> when we shot that browser scene? Yeah. And your agent forgot to tell you it was anal. And we're, I was like, okay, we're shooting anal. You were like, what? And I was like, oh, shit. And you did. Yeah. And, you know, like. But it, but it is. Uh, I mean, like, we told you. I was like, you don't have to. Like, we can make this a not. You were like, no, it's fine. It's fine. Give me an enema. I'm going to the bathroom. And I'll be right back. And like, it was a great scene. Yeah, it was. It was. But uh, because I also like, I'm very professional. If I'm, yeah. I have to do something. 
it was just taking me a little longer, but I, because yeah. I don't want to show up to say halfway done, let's put it mm-hmm. away. But anybody else will be like, oh, no, no, no. They don't, as soon as you told me that, I just changed your mindset and be like, okay, this is what we're going to do. We have to prepare and then we're going to do the best. If I would think that I was not going to do my best, I would have not done it. Yeah. But yeah, but it, when when I do have to, I like to prepare very well. I yeah. like to like, it's mentally, physically preparing. So when I get there, I'm my best. Mm-hmm. Not getting there like, oh my God, I hurt. Oh my God, I cannot do it. Like it mm-hmm. was show on camera. So yeah, preparing how, it becomes better. How do you prepare for a anal scene? I think mentally accepting that it's a job mm-hmm. and I don't do anal in my personal life. So it, Oh, interesting. Yeah. Do you just not enjoy it or? I think it like becomes again the preparation mm-hmm. work. It's like I said. That's true. I it's like, a lot of work and yeah. you're like, if I'm not getting paid for it, no. <laughs> not even about pay for it. It's like, a, a, like um, for example, like I would not eat some sort of food. Like at the beginning, I would not eat for like a whole day. Now, mm-hmm. because I'm, I talked to Asha, Kira, mm-hmm. she teach me a few tricks. Uh, I can eat the night before, but then it takes me longer in the morning to clean myself up because I feel like safe sets is clean sets. Mm-hmm. So I don't want to show up and have problems, but I do prepare mentally and I prepare physically, like I'll stretch it out so it doesn't hurt, like clean it very well. So when I get to set, I give my 100% and there's no all this and that. But uh, normally I think the biggest thing is mentally that everything is okay. Like this is a job and like I'm going to do good and then I'm not going to hurt myself. Mm-hmm. That that type of feeling, instead of just going there like, I'm going to suffer and it's going to hurt. And why yeah. am I doing this? That mentality, take it out of your head and just do it. Yeah. And I love it. I love anal sex in videos. Mm-hmm. One, because I'm doing it with someone that knows. Mm-hmm. And two, because I already know I'm clean, I'm safe. And, yeah. And my personal life, I like eating. So you cannot take me to dinner and want to have anal sex at night. It's yeah. not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> You yeah, know. that totally makes sense. So you've been a Browser's contract star for more than five years. How did that partnership start? Honestly, Browser's always loved me. I love Browser so much, but I always want to give this to Abella Danger. She got contract with Browser's and we were friends and she just pushed it. She's like, you need to have Luna Star. Luna Star is a big talent. She, she definitely put my name out there and I really appreciate her so much. Even if it, into the point that she helped me get my AVN, uh, being a host of AVN. I, she says no, but I know she did. She like put my name out there and then the people say, oh yeah, she could be that. But she definitely helped me with browser. She definitely helped me with AVN. Like she loved me and she so I see my my talent and like I'm a really good performer and she just pushed and uh, the rest is history. Um, I'm still with them and I love browsers and my family. And I would never leave there unless they leave me. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, I think the first time I shot you, I remember pulling up to set and you were still like kind of in the distance because it was a big parking lot. And you were, <laughs> I saw someone doing like lunges across the parking lot. Like, <laughs> Who the fuck? Like, I honestly thought it was like some weirdo because we were like in not the best part of town. Yeah. So I thought maybe it was like, I don't know, some buddy who had mental issues who was like (laughs) doing something and I pull up and it's you and you like got there early and you would like weights on your ankles (laughs) and you were doing like lunges in the parking lot (laughs) because at that time I was working so much I didn't have time to go to the gym so I would go early to stay and like do squats and push-ups I know but that's when I was like oh my god I love this girl I mean like the level of commitment that you have is truly amazing I do like I said like everything I do I try to do my 100% so like I would just like I needed to have a little pump in my butt or like get a little better and I trying to always be better than I what I am today, you know? So yeah, that was definitely me. I would do a lot of handstands and yoga. <laughs> all of those things. What are your favorite types of scenes to shoot? Honestly, I used to love Gonzo movies, mm-hmm. but now I really, really love Fisher. Really? I just got to be, for the first time, I did my own Fisher that I helped produce and direct with browsers. So it's in Destroy. But then I got um, selected for the Shakedown for Digital Playground. And I just did Project X. And I'm the main actress. And I loved it. Mm-hmm. It's very like, it's, it's like so nervous because I'm always scared of my English. Mm-hmm. No, not to sound the right way. And mm-hmm. being an actress and I act for real, not even having sex that day. It's mm-hmm. like, I was giving my 100%. But I loved it. I love it so much. So like, even when I was not shooting, I was stay until the end of the day. With everybody, I would say looking behind the cameras. I would say where everybody was acting. Like, I really, really love these big production movies. And I wish I can do more of those, that's for sure. 
So like those are my favorite movies right now. Like big features. Well, you don't mind the long days on set? Oh, I love it. I, over people always complain. Yeah. I'm like the opposite. I'm like I would stay until the end. Like I, I would tell them I would do this twenty times if it takes that. Like I, I appreciate what it takes to do something great. So yeah. I love it. I just generally love it. So you mentioned that you might want to move to working more behind the camera at some point. Do, what do you want to do specifically? Do you want to direct? Do you want to shoot camera, produce? Like I wish I could shoot camera because I have this vision, mm-hmm. but it takes a lot of knowledge. You have mm-hmm. to learn the cameras and the cameras are always changing. Every time that I try to learn a camera, then a new camera comes out. That's true. So I'm not, I'm, I'll tell you the truth, I don't like that part. I think maybe just directing and producing, I think I would like them to bring the... My my vision, like when, when I hear a story, when I read a book, I have such a vivid imagination. Mm-hmm. Like I imagine everything, every angle this way. Even when I read my scripts, even though they're doing something completely different, in my head I completely see it differently. Like the position, I can just see it when I read something. So I would definitely would like to bring that in my in the future. Like I just did uh, a movie with Leah and she's producing, she's directing it. And I can read her mind so well that the camera is here and I already see the camera moving without even looking. And I already like open it up the way that I would like to be recorded. And if the cameras do what I'm thinking, it's the perfect shot. Mm-hmm. And she was telling me, as soon as I was, you already were doing it. And I would give these crazy angles because I can see it before. Like, I don't even know what the camera is, but I can, if I can tell the cameras there, I already see how it was going to look. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what I've always been good at it because even when I have sex, I like sex looking at myself in my head, how it looks like. Hmm. Even there's no camera, I was having sex and I would like put positions that I know I look good. You know, you're not going to fuck me looking all oh, fraxo, looking all ugly. No, 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 no. You're only going to fuck me, me looking good. Like, <laughs> like the, I, if it's from the angle, I know I look this angle. Like, I just always had it on me. So I want to bring that one day into the, to this, in, this entertainment. I think I can do good. I think I can bring that to the to the public and people that watch it. So when you even have sex, like not on set, you know, with somebody that you're with, you still think about positions and how you look and like, are you still kind of performing in a way? It's not performing. I think it's always been me. Yeah. I always, I get thrown on by the way people see me. And mm-hmm. I think that's what I do so much good in videos because I imagine how people are looking at it and they see it. And mm-hmm. it's when well, my boyfriend or whoever I'm having sex, since my first time that I ever have sex, I always look at myself on their eyes. Mm-hmm. The way that they're looking at me, it turns me on if I know I look good, if I'm moving good. And mm-hmm. not just about the pleasure. Pleasure gives, comes with the look. Mm-hmm. I think I'm a very vision person. I like to see it. And then I want them to see the way that I am. Like, it's not a performance that I'm thinking about the position. It's more about the view, the looks. Yeah. If you can look good and feels good, it's amazing. Yeah. I, that's just... So I would say you're probably like a true exhibitionist. I'm a definite exhibitionist, but it's funny. I don't really like like that. Like I could, but it's not like I want to have sex in front of many people. Like mm-hmm. I wouldn't mind, but it's not that. It's more like one-on-one. Mm-hmm. I think that's what I like videos because I know millions of people going to watch it. Yeah. But it's only me and you here. Right, I right, just right. can't envision what these people would like to see. Yeah. Before I shoot it. Like when I'm shooting something in my own content, I think about it, whoever's going to watch it, mm-hmm. what they would like to see. Mm-hmm. And then I just go for it. And yeah. It's, it's been working out so well so far. If you have like an ultimate dream movie that you would make, what would it be about? Or what would the setting be? Uh, I think I already did it. That's the one that I, Brasso helped me produce. And okay. I'm very thankful. And it was like a, like a very like fantasy double seven movie. Like, like people, f- uh, coming after me and then me fucking them and they get so drunk of sex that they let me go and then I go and jump in a, the idea was to jump in a skydiving and mm-hmm. have sex in the way but it's all safe for work we couldn't do it mm. so we did parasailing mm-hmm. and then having sex on top of a car having sex under the rain wait hold on hold on you had sex while you were parasailing yeah well we have like dildos and masturbating and squatting. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> Squirting. Yeah. Are your parents? Is, is it raining? <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, it was like, hotter than it looks. Yeah, cause... I remember like one of the last scenes that I shot actually before I stopped shooting was you and Cherie Deville and Scarlett Alexis. Mm. And you squirted across the room <laughs> and hit the camera in the middle of the lens. And Steve was so excited about it. <laughs> the like, cameraman oh was like, yes, I got it. <laughs> like it was, he was drenched. It was so funny. <laughs> I know. So yeah, it was. I think that was thing. Um, I don't know. But wait, so hold on. Back to the paragliding <laughs> with the masturbation and the squirting. How did you do that? Well, it was uncomfortable because you like get the hang. You know, you had to like hang through here. So I just had to like pull it out and like we had like a double side dildo, and I was just doing it. And then the other girl, she was scared as shit. She was like, oh, shit, oh, my God. And I'm, like, moving that thing. And we just did it. And we had, like, a drum. We had, like... Oh, my God. So, wait, hold on. You guys are both on the same para. Yeah, we were, like, next to each other. And we were supposed to do it to each other. Like, we were, like, sucking the dildo, but she was so scared. So, I was just the one, like, masturbating and squatting and... It was that is wild. It was I'm really sorry, but like, the, like you're toning. I feel like you're toning it down a little bit. Like, I mean, because this is good. It, that's yeah, crazy. It is I would. Crazy. Lo- I'm afraid of heights. <laughs> I like, I would lose my mind. It's because I like scary things. Like, yeah. anything that scares me like makes me excited. I don't know why. Like it's like yes. Like it's something new. It's like a new feeling. <laughs> oh my god. Where was this scene for Brazzers? It's for Brazzers, and we did it in Miami. And how did it turn out? It turned out really good. It turned out really good. I won the like, Xbox for the scene. It was nice. Wow. It was really good. Cool. That's really crazy. Who's the scene with so people can look it up? It's uh, CJ, Ma- CJ Miles and I don't hate me because they, oh, Cassidy looks. Okay. Yes, it looks like. So wait, there was three of you. Well, in the premise, it was two, but the oh, okay. scene, it starts there and then we go to the beach and we fuck in the beach. Oh, the three okay. of us. Okay. So the intros. The intro <laughs> is me and CJ Miles. <laughs> you definitely need to watch it. <laughs> That's some fucking crazy shit. So yeah, I, I have crazy. been able to dance the Russell to do everything that I had like to do. Yeah. And I feel like I don't have an idea one, but if I ever come up with a crazy idea, I think he, they will make it happen. Yeah. So Are there any crazy ideas that you have that haven't come to Well, the only thing yet? that I had never done, I never done a gunbang. I never wanted to do it before because I'm a powerful scene person. So I never wanted to get fucked and feel mm-hmm. abused or, or taking over, like turning around. That's not excitement for me. Mm-hmm. But now I'm trying to come out with something like Angela White does. It's like, she's the power one. She's oh, the yeah. one fucking them. Yeah. So I'm like, if I can do something like that, then I would definitely do it. So I'm, I'm working on my ideal gambling. Mm. But it's like, it's like sex. Like I've done so much sex, but I only do stuff that I like. Mm-hmm. Like I don't want to never do anything I don't like. I never, mm-hmm. I don't think I would never do a blow again. Mm-hmm. I just generally, I love sucking dick. I can suck two or three dicks, but having so much and so many people come on me, I don't think that's sexy for mm-hmm. me. So yeah. I don't judge anyone. I don't wash it. I don't think. Yeah. So I, it's something like that. I don't like it. So I don't do it. But again, like it's, it's working. It's growing in me. Yeah. And I want to come out with a really good a scenario that I can do it. Right. So where you feel very much in charge and you're running, you're running it. And yeah, I understand you don't want to just lay there and get fucked. You mm. want to like be able to change the positions and really like. Well, I'm all, all my, my movies are very, I'm very the control person. Mm-hmm. Like I'm the dominant. So I want to be able to bring that always in all my scenes. And mm-hmm. I don't want it to be just one more. Mm-hmm. I want it to be good. Mm-hmm. I always talk about doing like a circus one. <laughs> Oh, that would but, be fun. But then I haven't come out with a sexy way of making it, you know. Everything oh. had to be sexy for me. Do no, wanna... do like make all the guys like scary clowns. <laughs> oh my god. I love crazy. scary clowns. You do? Yeah. <laughs> it's like that's kind of like my weird thing. Really? I don't yeah. like clowns. I mean, I don't hate them, but I don't think they're sexy. <laughs> but they're scary like an it? No, yeah, the it is scary as well. I don't know. That's just me. I'm just, yes, yeah. <laughs> I'm just weird. <laughs> <laughs> we all have our own little things. We worry. all have our own little, like, what's your, like, weird little kink? I, I would think I used to love uh, cartoon sex. Okay. Like an, like anime? Like anime type of thing. Okay. I don't know why I always would I do, gravitate to that. I do, too. I mean, there's something because it's so different, right? It's mm-hmm. not like actual people. And then, obviously, it can be so exaggerated because know, it's not real people. I think that and like I always always love public sex. Like I do like it's a fantasy of it. Mm-hmm. 
Even though I'm like, oh, yeah, I would do it. But, like, generally, I'm not going to go in the middle of the string and naked and mm-hmm. get fucked. Like, mm-hmm. unless it's a part of the scene, then I'll probably do it really good. Yeah. But the fantasy of doing it, I think I like it more than actually doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but I think public sex now is very, like, taboo-ish again. Yeah. So, I don't think I would do it anytime soon. <laughs> yeah. No, I I mean, when I say, like, I have a scary clown fetish, if a scary clown showed up. If my husband like dressed up as a scary clown, I, I'm not sure that I could do it. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? I might be just be like, I might it was in my head, that's but like, now that I see you, I'm like, yeah, no. I mean, there's a lot of fantasies that I have that like, I could never do it. in real life. Like it wouldn't, <laughs> it wouldn't work for me. Like that's why it's in my head. I think that's what's the beautiful about fantasy. That yeah. Fantasy. Exactly. Because I mean, like, I think when you, once you do your real fantasy and then you start thinking, of, what is next? Mm-hmm. So let me keep my fantasy for now. Yeah. Let me masturbate to them. I'm still coming with them. <laughs> exactly. Because then it's like, you know, it's almost like that, that thing when they say don't meet your heroes. Pretty much. Or don't meet your idols. Yeah. Like, don't actually play out your Fantas- deepest fantasies. Because then it's like. The no longer. And it never turns out exactly how you uh-huh. fantasize, right? So better leave it there. Yeah. So uh, I want to ask you a question that like every guy wants to know. What is your opinion on uh, penis size? Do you have a perfect ideal dick size? I don't have a perfect dick size, but I definitely like big dicks. Okay. (laughs) Uh, I can still do with a small dick, but mostly if you have a long relationship, I think having a normal size is better. Mm -hmm. But as a fantasy of like performing, I think having a good dick size is good. Mostly because I'm crazy and I like to move a lot. Mm-hmm. If you have a normal size dick, it just keep coming out. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. Like I cannot move. I cannot do the positions that I want to do. Yeah. Yeah. Because so, it pops out. So I, I don't know about inches, but, you know, people say 12 inches. That's so that's not it. Nobody wants to get destroyed. I think like six, seven, eight is a good size. Okay. Uh, but... I don't really look at it like that. I think you can have a normal size, but when you're very attracted to someone, that feels amazing. Mm-hmm. When you're very stimulated down there, it doesn't matter if it's a little finger. It feels really good. Okay. So I think having a good connection dick, I call it that. A like, good connection dick. dick. Yeah. I like that. It's like it has to bring the connection. You have to throw me on and then your dick doesn't matter really. Yeah. I do always say that for me and I think, this is true of of a lot of women that it's about the person attached to the penis, not necessarily the penis the itself. Penis. But in general, I do like big dicks. Like yeah. I always used to say, I would never date a guy with a small penis, <laughs> and I have. Mm-hmm. And but they were so sweet and so nice, mm-hmm. and they would eat me out so much. So the, 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 the side <laughs> dick is kind of like didn't matter so much. But there was moments that I would like, you know, because I I do perform with big dicks. Like, mm-hmm. I would go home and then I would not feel it. And I feel mm-hmm. so bad for him, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and it probably became an issue for him, too. Probably. I think they try it so much. And, yeah. And the self-conscious about it. And, yeah. And, but, for but example, like, honest, true, or vaginas, they stretch and they come back to their normal size. Mm-hmm. If I want to have sex for a month with porn people and I will go home and his dick was good size, you know? Mm-hmm. So I think the size is underestimating how much sex you have and the person that you're with. Yeah. What is dating like for you in general? Is it hard? Well, I used to hate it. I never had a boyfriend for so long. And then I started dating someone that I really like. I dated this guy that I was telling before. He was so nice because he would like be okay with me in the industry. Like I would go in for a scene just getting fucked and real. And I'll go home and he would give me love and cook for me. And it was so nice until it wasn't. I think all relationship with us, they're all accepting at the beginning until they really fall in love. And then they that actually changes. think that you're cheating with them because you're having sex and 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 a scene. And I remember one of my biggest problems is like I would come from set because I detached so much from my videos. And he'll be like, "Oh, what do you do today?" And generally, in my heart, I didn't do anything. Like I just not go home and bring my work home. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like I'm not thinking about what I did or mm-hmm. how the way that I sucked the dick. I just as soon as I finished, they said, "Cut!" Um, that that I just did just completely. Delete yeah, time. disassociate. Disassociate, like, I'm not going to go home. I'm like, oh, I d- fuck this and I did that. So he would get mad because he was like, you just came from having sex with two guys. How do you don't remember? I'm like, I do remember, but I'm not thinking about it, you know? And I think it becomes a problem. The- did you think that he thought you were playing it down or, like, lying to him because you thought that he would be upset? Mm-hmm. I think that they think that. And then the truth is, I used to tell them, I'm like, I would say I'm not cheating on you. And he was like, but you have sex with another guy. But I would tell them that's not cheating. Cheating is emotional. 
Mm-hmm. It's cheating for me because we do this industry. It's like going to dinner with them, going to a movie theater with them, and cuddling a bear after sex. That's for me cheating. Mm-hmm. So I guess they, they would not understand that because they're not in the industry. So I think that's one of my biggest problems. And I really try today and my last boyfriend, I, I really was so loyal to him. I've never been that loyal to anyone. Like to the point that like talking about no texting, no calling anyone other than my job. Mm-hmm. And and everything was amazing until the same it wasn't. You know, like he at the beginning he loved my videos and then and he would get mad. Like I would have I would go do a scene and I was working less because of him. I stopped shooting only fan guys because of him. Mm-hmm. Because I genuinely didn't want to. It's not mm-hmm. that I did it to please him. It's because I just didn't want to be with anybody else. Mm-hmm. But I still need to work, you know? Mm-hmm. So I would go do my movies and then he would want to have sex with me for like 10 days. Like, not like he was discussing about him, but it was more like, I think mentally, mm-hmm. he just didn't want to have that. But we did have a good relationship. We go to dinners. We would sleep together. So I let it go. But, but it did is hard. And I feel like if I ever have a relationship... And I always say I would never date anyone in the industry. I think I might try to be with someone in the industry. Maybe they would understand. Yeah. You know, and someone that helped me grow more as my career. Because every time that I'm dating with someone that is not in the industry, I think like they bring you down because mm-hmm. they don't understand. Mm-hmm. And they're like, oh, th- everything that you do is wrong. Yeah. And I'm like, I wish you were only knew that it's not like them. Yeah. But you got upset and they literally think that you're fucking everybody. You're fucking the Kramer crew, the light guy. They think they're fucking everybody. <laughs> Ain't nobody got time for that. No. <laughs> I mean, there's some girls that do. Have you seen the gaffers <laughs> that we work with? <laughs> or the camera guys? Like... But, but you know what it is? It's like, there's always one or two girls. They ruin it for all of us, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> That's yes. what happens, you know what I mean? And they think that everybody's the same way. And I mean, also not to mention the fact that, like, you're really not allowed to. I mean, I've no. always had a policy that, like, my crew cannot sleep with the models. But, like, I know browsers especially is, like, double down on that. Oh, super. We're not, like, yeah, nothing. I know you can cross over, like, one little joke, you know what I mean? But yeah. But these people still do stuff they're not supposed to. And once again, those people are not meant to be in this industry. Yeah. The people that are very talented and very professional, you will never see them doing all that stuff. You know, yeah. like all oh, the big, big stars, you never out here they're doing all that stuff. It's always like the new girl that's trying to like show up or mm-hmm. or do all of these things or think I'm at home or trying to propagate the part they make us as sex stars. Mm-hmm. And you don't have to do all of that. Yeah. But, or try thinking that it'll get them ahead if they yeah, and, and like, they, do some of them things. they do because I know many people that make it fast enough in the industry because they're fuck everybody mm-hmm. but at the end of the day it becomes the same thing that if you do stuff at the bottom it's only gonna last you this long you know yeah. what I mean they're gonna use you fuck you yeah you become a name and then you're nobody yeah because you have all of this trash after yeah. you you know what do you think is the secret to longevity in the industry I think being professional mm-hmm. and have a goal from the beginning like, you cannot just come. Like, even when I started, I did it for the money, but I had a goal. Mm-hmm. I had a goal, why am I doing this for it? And, and be very clear about that. Not just do it because I'm a freak. No, I want to be as fist pretty or want to make money. Like you have to have a reason for it. Mm-hmm. Like, and and take it professional. Like, this is a job. This is a career. This is not just fun little sex videos here and there. Mm-hmm. Like, people that have make it, Angela, why? Uh, Asha, Kira, all oh, Kiralee, all these big stars, they have made a real good career out of it because they do have fun in sets and the scenes, but they still have a whole life, the whole career out of it. And mm-hmm. I think that makes it a longevity. Yeah. I mean, I definitely, you know, I've been in the industry for a long time and there's never been a time when so many women come into the industry with like a real, like you said, like career mindset, an idea of building a brand and having a an end goal, mm-hmm. you know, and like they come in and they have a plan and they have like a roadmap yeah. as opposed to like, oh, I'm just going to like, you we'll know, see. have sex on camera and see what happens. Yeah. So, I And think- some of them, they still, if they're smart enough, they actually come back and create a career of it. Mm-hmm. And then you have the people that just do it for a couple of months, or a couple of years and they disappear. Mm-hmm. And some of them, I don't like to talk about bad about anyone, but I know some girls that like made a lot of money and they don't have anything now. Yeah. Because they were like, they don't have a purpose why they were doing it. They made yeah. a lot of money, they wasted, do whatever they wanted to do. And then 
Now they're like normal people without money and they already did all of this. Because mm-hmm. you have to own what we're doing because it's always going to come. It's gonna, You're going to carry this for the rest of your life. Yeah. When somebody asked me to be in the industry, I told them, same thing. You have a goal, you have a career, and you have to understand this is going to be forever. Mm-hmm. This is not like I'm going to do it for a month or two and then change my name. It doesn't happen. Yeah. If you have kids, if you have all of that. You have to know that you have to deal with this and you have to be strong enough to deal with this. And then you can do it. Don't mm-hmm. just, well, I want to do it for the money. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Think about it. Yeah. I always tell people where ask me, I kind of like talk them out of it and make I've, them think about it. I've talked a couple people out of it. Yeah, because everybody sees you like you're doing good and you have a career, you have money. That's all they see. They only mm-hmm. see the outside. Mm-hmm. But they don't see everything that we go through inside. And I always tell people this, that. Are you ready for this? Are you ready for that? Are you going to be strong enough for this? Are you, and once you put everything in perspective and think about it, I'm like, oh, yeah, it's not for me. Yeah. My favorite is when people are like, oh, well, my parents won't know what I do because blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. That's I'm just like, the first they are people totally going to find out. <laughs> find out. Except for Kazumi. Apparently, her parents still don't know, which I'm like really shocked about. I I'm had her on recently and she was like, they still don't know. And oh I was like, girl, how, amazing. How she- <laughs> Maybe they live under a rock. I don't know. <laughs> Good for her. But when, even when I did this, I was prepared to have this conversation with my parents. Yeah. Like I already knew. This is why everything that I did, I did it the right way. Because mm-hmm. whenever the conversation would come, I usually want to go and be like, oh, I'm doing this. We have any backup. Mm-hmm. When I had the conversation, I already have my money, my business. Mm-hmm. So I have something to back me up to be like, I'm doing this for this. Like my yeah. mom asked me, are you okay? Are you on drugs? Because mm-hmm. that's what people think. Oh, you're doing porn, you're doing drugs, you're doing all the bad things. And I'm like, no, I actually doing this, I'm doing that. I bought them a house, I bought them a car. So I give them a better life though. Like, okay, you're doing good. Mm-hmm. You know, like you're not crazy. You're not like how people see us, you know, like mm-hmm. as a porn star. So. What do you say to people who say that women who get into the adult industry are on drugs or must have been forced into it, must have been sex trafficked and they're being exploited and they don't really want to be there? I think that you don't know. Like we all have a different ways of why we came into the industry. And like I said, one of most of the people that I know, like really good girls, we don't have any trauma. Mm-hmm. We have any problems. We don't have any daddy issues. It's just, I think we saw an opportunity, like any person in this world that we open up and being free. Mm-hmm. To do something like that, sad that it's sex and people see it in the wrong way, even though everybody's do sex and everybody watch porn. Mm-hmm. But just because we're doing it, it's a problem because we're doing it outside. I think like you cannot judge anyone by the book of the cover. I mm-hmm. said the cover of the book. Judge so, a book by its cover. Okay. I, I said it completely right. <laughs> <laughs> you can never judge a book by his cover because uh, most of the people that actually make it, we don't have any problems. Mm-hmm. And it, with the, once they did have problems, they overcome it. Mm-hmm. Now, like I said, people ruin it for all, all of us. The, they do come into the industry with trauma and they propagate it out there so much that everybody thinks that we have problems. Mm-hmm. Because the ones that don't have problems, we don't talk about anything. Yeah. Now, the people that have one little problem, they just blow it out of proportion. And now we all come in that category. Yeah, I guess it's not a very juicy news story to be like, girl enters porn industry, builds career, is financially stable, takes care of her family, and lives a happy, fulfilling life. Yeah. Th- no one's going to read that one. No. But if you say, oh, she was trauma, she was raped, yeah. she was abused, uh, she, you know, like, that sells. Yes. Like, sells like crazy sex, yeah. you know? But, but I, I would tell people, like, do not think that everybody in this industry are crazy or are on drugs or have traumas. The opposite. Like I said, we made a career out of this. Mm-hmm. I think this industry is amazing. Mm-hmm. Like I met so many high-end people, like famous or like in the government, they will come up to me and know who I am. And I don't even know who they are. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because they watch our videos. And, and and that makes me realize how important and how big we are. Like if I were been doing drugs and doing all these things, I'm pretty sure they would not watch my videos. Because mm-hmm. I would see it. You can see when someone is actually generally having sex or someone is just being there. Yeah. Blow my. Because I think people really, fans want to watch videos where they feel that the performers are enjoying themselves. Yeah. Because then they can participate in that energy. Yeah, and they can see it, the I can be that person. Like you mm-hmm. fantasize of being a better person or having that person in your life instead mm-hmm. of having just a random drug, yeah. drug addict. You know what I mean? But I think a lot of people think so much bad about it, but I feel like the stigma is changing so much. I yeah. think porn is changing the stigma of mainstream is changing the stigma about us. 
that I think we're doing good. I think the all the years, all the people that fuck it up for us, I think all the people that are doing good now, we are changing the ways. We're changing people's mind. We went from like, like you say, like people thinking that we are doing how dramas and problems and to now having all these talents that they're just good and then doing good. And I think we're bringing that to this new new world. Like, no, we're good. Mm-hmm. We're making something out of it. And this is normal. Sex is normal. So I like that about uh, me and all the performers that I know that have changed the way so people think. Yeah. What is your favorite thing about the adult industry? I think how close everybody is in it. Yeah. Like the, the family, like I know people and said they probably see them once a month or maybe once a year. I just saw someone the other day in the, this porn party that I went and I never go to these parties. Someone that I met six years ago and we didn't change your number. And he told me, I consider you my friend, even though I never see you mm-hmm. because we connect so well. And once you like someone, doesn't matter if you see them all the time. It's like a family. I don't know how to explain it. Everybody, the producers, the light guys, like we see them all the time. Like I love them. I love so many people in this industry that I think that's one of my favorite things in it. Like going to set and be like, I miss you. I love you. Tell me about your life. Like we don't have to talk about it every day. But when we're there, we're like one. Yeah. And I think that's one of the most beautiful things about it. That's what I always say. I would never leave this industry because I'm going to miss all my friends. I know. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't, I cannot see them every day because we're always working. Mm-hmm. But when we get together, it's like so much love, so much respect. And I just love that about this, this I, industry. Yeah. I mean, I agree with you whenever people ask me what's my favorite thing. It's always the people. Mm-hmm. Like, right. And that's kind of why I wanted to start this podcast because I was like, there's, I've met all these incredible people and I want to like share these people with the world, mm-hmm. right? Because like they're so interesting and inspiring and funny and intelligent and ambitious and all of these things. And it's funny because just on Saturday, I went to random aside and sorry for the name drop, but I went to a Paris Hilton party, right? Mm-hmm. I went to like a one for her new album and it was like a small party at her place. And I am like not in the Hollywood scene at all. And the vibe there was just so different than the vibe like at a porn party. And I think like a lot of it is Hollywood is so, so big, right? It's and so vain. Yeah. And there's so many people like trying so hard to get into it where the adult industry is really small. And I think that, you know, people who are in it, like, first of all, there's a real camaraderie between performers because I think partially because of like the stigma, right? You know, like kind of we're the black sheep of the entertainment industry, mm-hmm. which I, I think brings us sort of closer because yeah. it's almost like an us against the world kind of vibe. Yeah. And there is, and it is so small, you know, everybody and you're right. You work with the same people all the time. And, you know, obviously you share like real intimacy with other performers. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have sex with them. So there's like that kind of bonding as mm-hmm. well. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, it's a really interesting dynamic that you don't see anywhere else. And going to this party and kind of seeing how I felt everybody was really kind of disconnected. And I just, I don't know, it felt very like performative and it just made me feel like I'm so glad I work in porn. Mm -hmm. I was like, I love my industry so much. Like I go to a porn party and just like you said, like, so good to see you. It's been so long. It like, and it feels like there's something about porn stars that is really genuine mm-hmm. that you don't see in other people. Mm-hmm. And I think it's maybe something about the vulnerability of your job, you know, like you p- really put yourself out there yeah, in a way that like nobody else does. And so I think that that enables this lack of pretense, right? Mm-hmm. Like you guys aren't trying to like be somebody you're not because like yeah, there you <laughs> are, you know? And so everybody can really be their genuine selves. Mm-hmm. And that's like, I think really unusual and really magical. And very beautiful. Very yeah. beautiful. Like you said, they we're just like so connected. Like even the guys behind the camera, you see everything of mm-hmm. me. So like, who am I to come and treat you any type of way? You mm-hmm. already know me. It's like, like you become family. You become yeah. like, I mean, like, I get so happy to see them all the time. And I've been to a few Hollywood parties too. And, and it's true, you don't get that. Everybody's trying to show up or like pretend something they're not. Mm-hmm. Or they're just vain and like think they're better than everybody else. And mm-hmm. it's just not, not the same. Yeah. And I think that's why everybody loves her. And like I said, like people, they don't admit it. When you talk to them in private, they'll tell you, I admire yeah. what you do. Well, the videos that you had done, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, and I'm like, okay. It feels <laughs> kind of good, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because you said the vulnerability, vulnerability of 
just showing up yourself all the time that people think they know you. Yeah. And I think that's beautiful. Yeah. I remember like, I don't know why it stuck in my head. I remember I asked Anna Fox something like a couple of months ago and I was like, hey, can I give this person, like, I think it was like somebody needed some paperwork or something. And I never give anyone's information without asking. <laughs> Just her response was like, she's like, girl, my butthole's on the internet. I don't care. <laughs> and I was like, and I don't know, there was thing about the way she said that. And I was like, <laughs> it's that attitude, right? It's like true. I'm out there, like I've got nothing to hide. Like here I am. And so, I always I, think about that. I think that's reason. super cool. <laughs> <laughs> I tell that people too, you know how girls, when we take pictures together. Yeah. And you still have to be like, what's your social media? I'm like, oh, I don't like this. One. I don't like that one. Yeah. I'm not a picky as much. I should maybe be a little bit picky because I see the pictures and I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> and I always tell people like, my, there's so many ugly pictures of me on the internet with all of this shit in my face and all of <laughs> yeah. that. Do you think I would care if one eyes is closed and yeah. a picture, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Some people do care so much. Like, mm-hmm. I know, you have to delete that picture. And I just, I'm so like, I don't care, man. Like, yeah. There's so much out there. I know who I look like. I know who I am. Like, I don't care what that picture looks like. Yeah. Yeah, it's that it's that feeling of like this everything out there because I've done this for so many years. There's nothing you can tell me, yeah, that I look good or bad right now. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Well, before we wrap up, I want to talk about your newest mainstream venture yes. that you just did. Yeah. So I got the opportunity with some of my friends here and and in, in LA, and they already done some like uh, low budget movies. And I got to help them produce and direct, and I loved it. I was like you, and said, "Shut the fuck up, let's shoot." Because <laughs> is that me? <laughs> a little bit sometimes. Because people, sometimes people like take so long. No, I. That and is or, or or industry is fast forward, and then I like, use shoot with the Hollywood people, and then like everybody's just like wasting the time and talking. Oh my god! And it's two o'clock in the morning, and they're complaining about that it's late. But I was like, you guys have been talking. Shit. Yeah. So like I. I'm so nice, but when it becomes job like that, I'm like, I become somebody else. And I mm-hmm. loved it. I was like telling people what to do. Let's do it like this. I'll be like this scene. Like I told you, I'm very graphic in my hand. I'm like, I want the, the fossil drip this way. And then the angle this way. I, I could see it in my head. Mm-hmm. And it's coming out in uh, October 24 uh, for Halloween. And I can't wait for it. It's called Suckers. Mm-hmm. And it's basically kind of like, what we do or not it's about an only fan girl uh, but it's the story is like a bunch of friends are in a Hollywood party and this girl me <laughs> uh, I guess I do something dumb I was something do something to me that I do something dumb and all of all of them record me and all of them become famous. One made a music about it, become famous musician. One become a big YouTuber. One become a big TikTok. All about that experience that they did with me. Mm-hmm. So they basically like use me to become so big. And then I was depressed and I I asked God to help me and then God never answered me so the devil did. Mm-hmm. And I become a vampire. Mm-hmm. And then I basically invite them over for a party and then I'm now I'm a big success for OnlyFans girl. That's what they came to me to get social media and then I kill them. I kill them all, almost all of them and then, you know, you have to watch it. <laughs> uh, but, it but it was really good and it was a really low budget movie but we give all our heart into it. Mm-hmm. This is like my first one, and I, if everything goes well, we sold it to Tubi. It's gonna come out in Tubi. Uh, I want to do more. Like I want to do it, and, and I didn't want to act because, like, you can tell, like, the first acting scenes, I was so scared. Even though I know the script by heart, once they say action, because I'm trying so hard, I was mm-hmm. a little nervous. I had to do it a few times, but then when the movie process, oh, I'm like so in it. Like I was mm-hmm. so into it. So like, uh, as much as I like to acting, that I'm not as good at it I'm honest I want to produce I love producing I want to bring my my mentality there like I want to produce porn too you know Mm -hmm. but but I think mainstream is it's just a little step on it yeah you know so if everything goes well then I I want to I want to show the world with my vision Awesome. And hopefully it will come out. I love that. Thank I love you. that. Well, I'm definitely going to have to check it out. Yes. Yeah, so if it, Whenever it comes out, I'm going to get like a place and rent it a theater and play it. So I may invite you. Okay. Yeah. No, Are maybe you... not. I'll invite you. I'm sorry. Okay. Maybe. <laughs> no, what I said maybe is because I don't have the place yet. So I don't know if I will have it. I can help you with that, actually. Mm-hmm. I know somebody who gets like, because we were going to do a screening for a movie that we're doing. Oh, that would um, be So I actually know someone. No, that would be that nice. Because I, I have a few with. people that I would like to show at the same time. And I, yeah. I sing only pieces. Mm-hmm. I haven't watched the whole thing because I don't want to. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I don't want to experience with everybody. So I definitely would take that. Yeah. A screening is a great idea, too. It's also a great opportunity to get social media mm-hmm, so it. that people can, you know, come and 
like promote it, it. yeah it's a good way to like promote it that's why i'm having the party for my kickstarter you Look, know like it's I'm really fine. just about like the social media because get the hype up okay i like so. that. okay thank you so much i yeah. appreciate it thank you all right well luna it's been so awesome thank connecting you, with you and we're gonna do a little patreon q a because you guys sent some questions in for us um which you can access only at my Patreon, patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. But uh, for now, Luna, can you tell everybody where they can find you online? So hi, everybody. Uh, you can find me on Instagram, Luna 5 Star. Uh, Twitter, that I don't use as much. <laughs> Cute Luna Star. TikTok, Luna 5 Star. TikTok. And OnlyFans, Luna Star. So. Yay. Amazing. And you guys can find me on Instagram and on Twitter or X at Holly Randall. I already threw out my Patreon um, link there. And just go to hollylinks.com for access to all of my platforms. Everything is there. Thank you guys so much for watching. And I will see you on the next one. Thank you for having me. Thank you. (laughs) 